everyone. Um, so the video I made a couple of days ago was a little bit more about me and how I wanted this to go was really to make different videos about the different things that happened before leading up to the court stuff. But there has been a few developments that have really put even a bigger sense of urgency in me that this needs to be told. This story needs to be told. This manipulation of the system needs to be told. Other people, other parents are seeing these and reaching out to me and I'm very much starting to realize that this isn't just my fight. Things need to change. This is not okay and it's abusive and it's going on right here in our own community. So today I'm going to talk about the restraining order that um, my stepfather filed and I'm going to try to tell the short version of how we got to where that situation was late in later videos I will come back and explain certain things in a little bit more detail but this needs to come out so um, we talked about the annulment we talked about how they Chris Josh Lisa were all bullying me, assaulting me, lying about me, etc. We've talked about all that. So at this point, I'm trying to do this as chronologically as possible with these videos to make it very easily digestible because it's a complicated fucking story with a lot of weird twists and turns. Um, so once Josh filed for annulment and me and both my children were then evicted from military housing because Josh filed for this annulment and he wasn't ever at the house. I mean, he didn't step foot in that house, I don't think, more than once or twice after he moved out. He literally just left and just never looked back. I didn't hear from him very often. There wasn't a lot of communication, and when there was, it was nasty. He was not nice to me. Um, so we ended up getting evicted from military housing at Wadsworth Military, and I knew I mean, I had been obviously looking for somewhere to go for as soon as I found out that he was filing for the annulment, I was looking for somewhere to go. I had called, I had applied for Section 8. I, I mean, every resource was given to me, I followed up on. But I had it, I didn't have a lot of very, very close friends because I had been sick for many years and kind of just stayed in my house. I worked from home. I, you know, I was very focused on my children. Even after Josh left, I didn't really date. I wasn't interested in it. Um, I didn't, so I didn't have a lot of very close connections. Um, Jennifer didn't speak to me anymore. I mean, like for many years before this happened. And I was so naive. I actually thought when I got evicted, there was something in the back of my mind who like I was figuring out that I didn't have anywhere to go. And I thought, well, maybe this eviction will and be a blessing in disguise because what I figured was if I didn't have anywhere else to go, my mom lived right down the street. I had already housed her and her husband for 10 years for free. Don't forget that. Um, and I figured, and she had an extra room that wasn't being used. And I thought she would let me stay there. What mother wouldn't? That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Nope. Zero sense to me. Um, turned out she no, I couldn't. I couldn't stay there. At first she said that I couldn't stay there because I had two dogs. Well, I had three dogs then because Bailey was still alive. Um, but then I told her, I said, okay. When I realized there was nowhere else to go, I said, okay. Um, I, we, I was at, I was at the, the, not the pound, the Virginia beat, the animal rescue, whatever on bird neck, ready to surrender my dogs. She knows this is the last of what I have, right? Um, I'm ready to surrender them. And right before I go in, I'm full of tears. I have nowhere to go. Everyone is still turning on me. And right as I was about to surrender them, she comes out and says, your grandmother doesn't want you living in that house. So even if you do get rid of the dogs, you can't stay there. And that was, I mean, I can still feel that knife in my heart. I can still feel it. I can still feel it. 
And, and at that point, that was when I made this very weird post because I was at, there was, there was nothing there. I was so traumatized. There was nowhere for me to go. My own mother was saying, you're going to live in your, like, anyways, I didn't end up living there. What, and you know, I'll come back to that in a later video and we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. Um, but once we got evicted, I did send my children to live there because if I was going to be living at a campground or my truck, nothing that they've said makes me a bad mom because not most of what they've said isn't true or is a weird skewed version of the truth. But if I were to put my kids in my car, like babies need a roof. Okay. They need a house. And even though Jennifer and Chris and I weren't on the best of terms, I sent them there because I thought they'd be safe there. And that's my, that's my priority is my children's safety. That's always been my priority, which makes this entire thing even more insane and crazy. Um, so they were staying there. Um, and I was staying in campgrounds for a while and I ran out of money to do that. So I ended up like li literally living in my truck with my dogs. Um, they ended up, Jennifer and Chris ended up filing a CPS complaint about me, even though, which I found out just last summer after all this was over, that that CPS was, complaint was fraudulently even opened because, and this is what a lawyer, the lawyer that I spoke to, that I paid to speak to, told me, and I was telling him this story, what happened, and he goes, but you had already sent the children to live with your mother, right? And I said, yes, I had already sent them there, I wasn't living there. And he goes, well, then you, there was no reason to open a CPS case against you. You didn't have, you, you weren't caring for those children at the time. You had already put them somewhere else when you were homeless. And that's true. Um, so, um, a CPS case is opened. And there was something that happened before that where I showed up at my mom's house to ask to use the bathroom. I, it was like. It was at nighttime. I feel like it was maybe a little after 10. I'm not 100% sure. It wasn't that, 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 that late. And I I just knocked gently. It wasn't, it wasn't crazy. It wasn't crazy at all. And that was the night I found out that I was no longer welcome at my mom's house. She didn't answer the door. I didn't even see her that instant. It was Chris that answered the door. And I knocked. Had, I didn't know I wasn't allowed there. They had never told me that this was a new thing. There's, you'll notice there's a lot of things that just pop up out of nowhere, things I were never told about that I found out, anyways, I was living in my truck and I showed up to use the bathroom, and I remember it vividly, I remember exactly what happened, exactly what happened, because it broke my heart, I knocked on the door at my mother's, and Chris answered the door, I think, I'm pretty sure the kids were sleeping, I think Jennifer was probably asleep too, I only spoke to Chris, and I said, hey, can I use your bathroom, and he goes, why? And I was like, because I have to pee and I don't feel good. My stomach was hurting. Um, and he goes, go to a restaurant. That was it. And I said, why? And he goes, you don't belong here. And he closed the door in my face. And that was it. I did not knock again. I did not yell. I did not say anything. I remember standing there. My heart dropped. My kids were in there. And I'm being treated like this. I just began to sob. And I turned around and walked to my truck. And as I was sitting there, just figuring out where I was going to go next, he had already called the police on me to get me out. There was no altercation. There was nothing. It wasn't like I was refusing to leave. I wasn't refusing to leave. I was sitting in my truck trying to figure out where I would go next. And before I know it, a cop car is behind me. And I'm waiting for body cam footage from that incident. I know what happened. He know Chris knows what happened. And from what I remember, it seemed to me like the responding officers also were like, why? They knew what happened. They were very nice to me. They, I don't know. It'll be interesting because I don't know what he said to those police officers. I feel like if you told them the truth that, oh, she's knocked on my door and walked away, they would have been like, maybe he would have got, I don't know. I just don't, I feel like, and once... You've, you're done watching this video and see what, hear what he put in this restraining order. 
He had to make something up, and I don't know what that was. I haven't seen that footage yet. I don't know what was said. Um, but, but when I get it, we will certainly do a video on that, too. So that had happened. They had filed this CPS thing. The woman, the caseworker, who got fired halfway through this whole thing and was replaced by Jonathan Brown, um, and that was never brought up in court either, which is interesting, but um, she texted me because I didn't have an address. She couldn't come. They couldn't come visit me this time. Jennifer and Chris made sure I was homeless when they did it this time, right? That was planned. I see that now. I, I could have never imagined that. So I get a text to my phone from a social worker, um, and I am living in my truck, and I'm thinking, I could kind of probably use help from a social worker right now, and I didn't understand, I didn't feel attacked because I didn't know I, there was a, there was no reason to attack me, so when I found out that it was an attack, it was shocking, this is all so shocking, and it was like happening so quickly, and like, there wasn't time to reframe in between these lies and traumas and everything that was being thrown at me to even reorient myself to what was happening. It all happened over such a short period of time and out of nowhere. It, I've thought about, I've thought about it for over a year, you guys, like gone over in my head, like what could I have done differently? What did I do? Because it would almost be easier to accept if there was a reason I can't find one I can't anyways so she says so the CBS worker says all right come meet me at the social services office whatever and I do still living in my truck she um, brings back brings to me all of these allegations of mental instability that I'm crying all the time they bring up the weird post I made after Jennifer just dropped this huge bomb on me while I was facing extreme living conditions it was a mess, right? They created a safety plan, and in the safety plan, it said that I would, um, it said the wording was something of stepping out of the caregiver role of my children, which honestly I had already done because I could not care for them. That's why I put them at Jennifer's house. Somehow trusting in my brain, this is my mother, and they'll, she'll treat them and me the way we all deserve. So, it was a safety plan. I did not sign it. I was kind of thrown off by it, to be perfectly honest. But I agreed to it verbally. I said, yes, okay. Um, I'll take, I'll step out of the safety role. We could do supervised visitations, whatever. I, I said that I wasn't going to sign it. I didn't sign it. And she put on there, refused to sign without a lawyer. Because that's what I told her. I said, I would like to show this to a lawyer first before I sign it. I don't, this is all new to me. Like, I don't. No, but I, but I agreed still pretty much. Um, and I, I don't know. So I leave there, and she's like, I'm going to get you it was some resources that she never did. Um, and it was, it became blatantly obvious that she had some kind of weird something against me. I, I, there are some things that I'll never understand. There's some things we're all never, I, I don't know. Um, so that all happened. And then I ended up staying. I scrounged up enough money to be able to get a cabin at the campground across from my mom's neighborhood. And I that was the last time I heard my daughter's voice. Um, I remember our conversation very vividly. I said, hey, baby. I called her. Hey baby, I said, guess what? I'm staying at the KOA across the street. Um, why don't you have Nana bring you over and we can walk around, look at the campground and stuff. You know, I was definitely trying to shield my children from all of this other insane drama and betrayals that were going on around me. Absolutely, I was trying to do that. And now, and I would, I had done that for many years with these people. And now I, I wonder if. I don't know if that was the right thing because when I think about how my children are seeing it now, they never heard me say one bad thing about Jennifer or Chris or Lisa or Josh. Never. I wouldn't do that. 
because I would never want to take their family. I don't, I think that's, I know that that's child abuse. Um, and you don't ask children to cope with grown up issues, adult problems. You don't do that. That's not fair. Let your babies be babies, okay? It's only going to be for a short while. And we can't go back to childhood, right? Um, so I had never said anything nasty about any of them in front of my kids. And now they're in a position where for two years they have been inundated by being surrounded by people who hate me. Hate me for reasons that I don't even understand. I've asked Josh outwardly. I've asked Jennifer outwardly, why do you hate me? Please give me a reason. Just tell me why. Tell me what I did to you. Please. And they never have an answer. I've also asked all of them several times, why am I losing custody of my... I've asked Josh, why did I lose custody? What did I do? What did I do to Mona? Why is Mona so upset with me? That's not how we left terms. What happened? What have you been saying to her that is making her hate me so much all of a sudden? And he never has the answer. Even if I say, why is she upset with me? I would like to know why. I think that's a valid question to have. If your daughter, if your daughter or son are so mad at you, I feel like you should be allowed to know why they're mad at you. Josh doesn't have an answer for that. Aside from what she's been told. At least not for me, he doesn't. Because I've asked him. And I have text proof of that. I have screenshots of a lot of stuff that I don't think they realize I have screenshots. But, um, the last phone call, I was staying there and, hey baby, this is exactly how it went. Hey baby, um, um, I got a cabin across the street. Stay in 603. I even remember the cabin number. I'm staying in 603. And at that campground, that K, K ways are really good for kids because they have like playgrounds in there. There's like a jumpy patty thing. And I thought we could play on that. This would be a great quality time for me. With my baby, it's like I had been already not living in a home for, for like a month now. Um, and she goes, Okay, mama. I said, I love you. I said, I miss you, baby. She said, I miss you too, mama. I said, ask Nana to bring you across the street, and we'll walk around the campground and spend some time together. And she said, okay, Mommy, I'm going to ask her. And I said, okay, baby, I love you. I'll see you soon. She goes, okay. She didn't come. And that was the last time I've ever spoken to my child. And that was, that was in March of 2022. We are now at the end of February, almost to March of 2024. That was the last conversation I had with my child. Um, soon after that, someone blocked my number. I believe, it is my belief that Jennifer or Chris went into her phone and blocked my number. Um, she stopped answering my text messages. And keep in mind, I have never even disciplined this child. I have never even raised my voice to her because I didn't need to. She is such a good kid. Like, there's no need to, there was never, ever, ever any need to yell at that. Never. Never even to change my tone. Like, such a good little girl. Such a kind heart. So sweet. And she still is. I know she still is. Even though I haven't been around her. I'm her mama. I know that. <coughs> so, after that phone call, Jennifer and Chris, Josh was deployed when all this was happening. It's hard for me to blame Josh for any of this part because he wasn't here. He wasn't here for most of this. He didn't show up to any of these court dates, not the protective order date that we're going to talk about now, not any of the other ones until the very last custody date when I was coerced to sign over my rights by my attorney. And we'll get into that too. Um, he wasn't there. Jennifer and Chris, without a judge, okay, without any kind of judge, they took it upon themselves to cut off contact, my contact with my children altogether, all together. There were no more responses from my kids after that when I would text them. Um, I went up to Mona's school one day to try to have lunch with her. And I was, when I tried to check in, I was sent to the office and Chris and Jennifer had already called the school and told them that I was not allowed to be anywhere around my children, and that was not true. No judge ever said that. CPS didn't even say that. Nobody ever said that, but they told that to the school. So I went to the school to have lunch with my baby, 
and I wasn't even allowed to see her because Jennifer and Chris had gone to the school before any court stuff happened, had gone to the school and said, Jamie's not allowed contact with her daughter. And nobody ever, they said that, according to them, that was, CBS didn't say that. CBS didn't say that. No judge said that. They said that. And you're going to start to see how, how these dominoes fell, okay? So they cut off all contact. And I had gone to school. I just told that story. I had called the school. Um, I had called CPS multiple times, this woman, multiple times saying, they're not letting me see my children. This is what they're doing. I texted her multiple times. I have these screenshots still. I have proof of all of this. Like, texted her multiple times. They are not giving me any access to my own. My children have been ripped from me right now without a judge, without any kind of due process, and without reason. And she was like, there's nothing we can do. Sorry. What? I talked to her supervisor who also told me there's nothing they can do. Sorry. What? They knew I was living in my truck. I could, there was, I didn't have, there was nothing that I had, like, to call anybody and be, like, when you're living in your truck, it looks really bad. You look like a piece of shit. You look like, it looks bad. You can't call some, like, nobody nobody was believing me. I, I'm pretty sure I saw the emails I sent to the school, to the social worker at the school, who was different than the social worker who was coordinating some of this. So a month went by, and finally, because I knew where they live, I had been in the house multiple times until they all suddenly told me I couldn't go, and they didn't understand why. So finally, I was like, one day, after I had gotten out of the truck, and this was like a month later, I had sold our truck to buy this RV that I was now living in. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go. If nobody's going to let me see my child and I'm not allowed at their house, they're just going to call the police on me and say I'm trespassing anyways. There's no point in doing that. I'm just going to get in trouble. Um, making any kind of scene is going to make everything worse. They're going to be like, look, told you she's crazy, told you she's crazy. But I, but it had been a month, a month since I had seen or heard from my children. And now two years later, a month doesn't seem like that long, but I hadn't been away from my baby for more than 24 hours in the last 10 years up until then. I mean, we were like this, we were tight and I was homeless and nobody was talking to me and I was still sick, still dealing with all the sicknesses I'm dealing with today, the physical ones. And I don't know. I can't explain that kind of confusion, that kind of heartbreak, that kind of betrayal. It's almost like there aren't words strong enough to explain that kind of pain. But so I tried all other other ways to see or talk to my children and nothing was working. So I thought, okay, well, I will go because I knew that Chris walked her from the bus stop every day. So I was like, well, what I'll do is I'll go. And I know when she's getting around school and I'll just meet them while they're walking from the bus stop. There's no, there was no judicial CPS rules that said I was, uh, was not allowed to see them. There was not, that did not happen. I don't know why Jennifer and Chris, I don't think they thought that in their brains. I think they made it up and just lied to a whole bunch of people that that was what, that's not what was happening. And I can get those records from the original CPS shit to prove it. That's not what happened. So I... I'm in the RV, and the way their neighborhood is, it's like you, okay, so you go this way to get into the neighborhood, and then you make a right, and then you have streets of houses like this. And the way those streets are, the parking for each house is a part of the street. And I was in an RV. Those RVs don't fit in those kinds of streets. And even if I did fit it, it would be really difficult to turn around and come back. And I had just gotten this RV. I wasn't like... I was still like very much learning how to <laughs> drive it and maneuver it. But there was a cul-de-sac right past that street that the RV fit into. So I went there like right around before she was going to get off. I parked the RV. I was waiting. Um, and, and I saw Chris. I was waiting in the RV. 
Actually, I think I had, like, stepped out of the RV, but I was, saw Chris walking towards her bus stop, so I was going to wait for them to walk back so that it didn't look weird. Like, I don't know. I, I didn't want it to look like exactly what he said happened when what he said happened didn't happen. Um, I waited for them to walk back. I remember this very vividly because I've thought about it every single day since every single day. This is the last time I was able to have a conversation with my child face to face. I see them walking back. I start walking up to them and I said, hey baby, I said, I love you so much. I said, how are you? How softball? I leaned down and gave her a hug. I was walking with them. Chris was not saying anything. He didn't say anything to me. She was walking in between us and I was walking and I was like, oh my goodness, I love you. Mommy misses you so much. And I said, I got an RV. This is when I told her about the RV. I said, I traded the truck and got an RV. I'm trying to act so excited about this because I don't want to scare her. This is my baby. I don't want her to be hurting. I don't want her to think mommy's struggling living in an RV. I tried to make it sound exciting. And I said, I got an RV. I was like, you want to come see it? I said, Papa can come. Very, very clearly. I know that he heard that. I said, you and Papa can come look at the RV. You want to come see it? And she looked up at him and looked at me and she goes, I love you. Da, da, da. And then she looked at him and he looked down at her and he grabbed her hand and he said, come on, Mona, let's go put your backpack in the, in the house. And she said, okay. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll, Stay out here. Um, and they walked in the house and um, closed the door. And I waited for like two minutes. And the door didn't open again. And I left. I left. They had already called the police on me for doing nothing, just asking me to the bathroom, and I knew that they were going to try to call the police if I stayed any longer, I left, and that was the last time I ever hugged my baby, and the last phone call, and if I had known then that that would be the last time I would talk to her for so long, I would have said so much more, I would have, I would, it would have been a longer call, I would have said, you're strong. I would have said you're beautiful. I would have said you're brave and amazing and you're so kind. And mommy loves you so much. And whatever happens, baby, I'll always love you. I'll, and I'm always here for you. I would have said so much. I didn't know it just came out of no. So. That was really hard. I got my RV. I don't even think. No one ever even saw the RV because it was in the cul-de-sac, like right past their um, their street. I got an RV and I drove to the Wendy's down the street and I just sat in the parking lot and I just cried until that night. I just cried like I. How is this happening? I don't know. Okay, so after that. A few days later, I was in the RV, and um, I was actually at the Home Depot parking lot when I got this. Um, a police officer knocked, I was sleeping in the Home Depot parking lot in the RV. I couldn't afford a campground anymore. Um, and he was really nice to me, too. Like, he was like, have they have they said anything to you about, because he it was morning time. He goes, what you doing in there? And I was like, I was sleeping. And he goes, have they, they given you a hard time about, you know, parking here? And I had only been there for a day so far. And I was like, no. I had only been there from the night before, rather. And I said, no. And he was like, okay, well, if um, they do, you know, you can you can go to Walmart. Like, a lot of police told me that when I was living in my truck. I think that's, I feel like, I mean, I was told that so many times by law enforcement. You can stay at Walmart. Maybe it's because it's well lit. Maybe it's because not private I don't know but they always tell you go on I said thank you I know and he gave me this I didn't really understand what it was so it was a protective order I didn't understand what I was like I when he said that first I thought he meant they had said like because 
when that time from video, I want to talk about video three, when they tried to get me admitted and institutionalized, and when they call someone, if they call a magistrate and say that you're a danger, um, that's called some kind of protective order too. So that's kind of what I thought they were trying to do. No, it was a restraining order that they had filed for me against my own children. And this was, when is, okay, so this says that this was in, it says that it was in April. I feel like I wrote, oh, no. It says it was com committed in April, subscribed and sworn to before me this day. So it looks like this was filed on May 3rd. I remember it was right around Mother's Day. They got a restraining order saying that I couldn't contact my children or my mother right before Mother's Day. And we'll talk about that Mother's Day too. That was that I remember very vividly. First mother with first Mother's Day in my life without a mother. First Mother's Day since being a mom without my kids. Hard hard stuff. Okay. So this is um, what Chris went to the magistrate and told um, and, and this is what Chris said to the magistrate after that happened I'm going to be reading word for word I just told you the real story I told you exactly what happened it wasn't a very long interaction it was a devastating interaction for me but it wasn't very long I didn't get to really talk to her I got to tell her I love her. I asked her how softball was. That was it. And then he he whisked her, like, washed her off, right? Um, and the door just never opened. They just stayed inside there. And I don't know what happened inside because I left. All right. So this is what it says. <sighs> Jamie Grigolite has orders from CPS not to see or talk to her two kids that we have temporary custody of. That's the first sentence, and it's a bald-faced lie. I, there were no orders that I wasn't to see or talk to my children. In that safety agreement that I didn't even sign, but I agreed to verbally, that's true. It said I would be taking out of a, out of a caregiver role. And that, and I'm pretty sure it said in there I would get supervised visitation. I'm, I'm fairly certain. But nowhere, I would never agree. I would never, I mean, if they had told me, hey, you can't, you're not going to be able to see or, see or talk to your kids in that CPS, I would have been like, ah, uh, no, that's, I mean, I would have remembered that, right? And we can get, I think I even still have copies from that, that we can look over. That was not true. So this is the first purge, perjury in the first sentence of this restraining order. I'll read it to you again. First sentence. Jamie Grigolite has orders from CPS not to see or talk to her kids that we have temporary custody of. I never had orders not to see or talk to my children. There were different orders. The judge never said anything. I never signed anything. Okay, it's first lie. Let's keep going. Um, oh, unless they want to, it says. Unless they want to. They do not want to. Which by this time, it had already been a couple months they have been staying with Jennifer and Chris. They heard lies, so many lies about me, including the time I was just talking about when nobody was there and he called the police on me for asking to use the bathroom. I'm sure they heard a completely, entirely different story than what actually happened. But like I said, once we get the footage, I think it'll be a lot easier to go through all that and really see the truth. Um, she was standing... She was standing behind the brushes by our house and ran up to Ramona and grabbed onto her. That's what it says I did. That's not what happened. I walked up. I walked towards them while they were walking towards me. We were walking towards each other. And I bent down and I gave her a hug and I said, baby, hi, I love you. Da, 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 da. That was, that was, what, that's, that's what he's saying, I guess. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't run up to her and grab her. That's not even close to what happened. Okay. Ramona did not like her touching her. It's just interesting because I had never, Mona has never been afraid of me. Not until she started living with Chris and Jennifer. 
and they started coercing her and brainwashing her. And we're going to talk a lot about memories. We're going to talk a lot about false memories. And we're going to talk a lot about brainwashing and child grooming in one of the very soon upcoming videos because that's what parental alienation is. These children are being groomed to hate their parents for no reason. Um, I did not see fear in Mona. I did see confusion, but I did not see fear at all. I think she really wanted to spend time with me, but she looked up at Chris like, what do I do? Clearly already under his manipulation. And can you imagine how I feel that I'm the one that put those kids there when I found out that I was going to be homeless? I put them there. To be fair there, I don't know where else they could have gone, but I feel, I feel guilty for that. I, I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know, but I, I don't know. I, all of it is, it's, it's a mind fuck. It all is, the whole thing. Okay. Mona did not like her touching her. She tried to get into, oh, she tried to get Ramona into her RV. When I said, I must, I guess that means when I said, hey, baby, I got an RV, trying to be excited about it. So you want to come see it? Papa can come, too. I made a very clear point to say that. Want to see my RV? Papa can come, too. Okay. She tried to get Ramona into her RV. Ramona was shaking and scared. She was not shaking, and she didn't look scared to me. She just looked confused. And I know my baby. I know my baby better than anybody else. She did not want to get, oh, she did not want to let go until I told Ramona to go inside our house and put her bags down. That's not what happened. I had let go of her. I just hugged her. I hugged my daughter. That was it. I may have been like going like this to her or something while I'm trying to like talk to her and be excited. I hadn't seen her in a month, but it wasn't like I was holding on to her and she was struggling. If that was not even close to what happened, there was no altercation. So I told Ramona to go inside and put her bags down. I told Jamie to leave and she got in her RV and tried to get Mona to come outside to her RV. That is a complete fabrication. The only thing he ever said to me was, no, I don't, he didn't say anything to me. The only thing I heard him say during this very short, maybe five minutes of interaction was, come on, Mona, let's go inside and put your bags down. He never told me to leave. And once they were gone, I never came back. I knew they were going to call the police on me. I was standing there outside their house for two minutes. And then I walked back to my RV that was on a totally different street and left. This is a complete fabrication of truth. Okay? A complete fabrication. I told Jamie to leave. She got in her RV and tried again to get Mona. No, I didn't. I left because I knew you were about to call the police because you're a crazy person. Um, to come outside of me. I called the police. I called the police and told them what happened. On the following Monday, Jamie tried to get Mona out of school and um, her in her RV. That never happened. That never happened. And when I had gone to Mona's school, it was before this. And I just went to go have lunch with her. I never even got to see her because you liars had told the school that I wasn't allowed to see her when that wasn't true. I never even got close to my daughter. Good job lying. You got what you wanted. I never tried to get her from school into my RV. What? What? When did that happen? I just went to go have lunch with her at the school. I wasn't trying to even take her out of the school. Um, it says she continues to call and try to see and talk to Mona. That's true. I did continue to try to call and talk to my daughter. I did because you took her from me and I, nobody told me why. I didn't know what was happening to her. You would cut off. And these are my parents, guys. Chris and Jennifer are my, Jennifer is my biological mother. And Chris married her when I was 10 years old. And you know what? Chris, I know you're watching this. And I have a message for you. You helped raise me, right? There was a time I loved you. I defended you a lot. And I respected you. 
I don't feel any of those things when I think about you now. None. Not one. I think of lies. I think of a liar. A liar. A deceitful, spiteful, mean, soulless liar. And I don't know how you changed because I swear you used to be a good dude. I remember you being a good person when I was younger. I don't know what happened. So, he said that to the magistrate. I'm, you know, actually, let's just read it again. You know what? Now that you know, let's just re go ahead and read through it one more time. This is, I'm you're, so you can hear word for word what the magistrate heard without knowing any of the backstory that I just told you. Jamie Grigolite has orders from CPS not to see or talk to her two kids that we have temporary custody of unless they want to. They do not want to. She was standing behind the bush, the brushes, bushes by our house and ran up to Ramona and grabbed onto her. Ramona did not like her touching her. She tried to get Ramona, she tried to get Ramona to get into our V. Ramona was shaking and scared. She did not want to let go until I told Ramona to go inside our house and put her bags down. I told Jamie to leave, and she got in her RV and tried again to get Mona to come outside to her RV. I called the police and told them what happened. On the following Monday, Jamie tried to get Mona out of school and take her in, in her RV. She continues to call and try to see and talk to Mona. The last four lines of this, from here down, is complete fabrications. Complete fabrication. Not even, not even a smidge of the truth. Not even a smidge of the truth no semblance of the truth in here um i once they went inside i did not try again i knew what he was doing he had called the police on me before just for asking to go to the bathroom i left okay that never happened that never happened and um oh and the school thing i never tried to get her out of her school into my rv i was, i went up there tried to have lunch with her and that was before this all lies perjury everywhere perjury 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 is a felony getting getting a restraining order under false pretenses that's what happened so i learned how restraining orders work in virginia beach apparently they're good for three days and then there's court date and then they decide there's got another one well keep in mind when the first when the three-day one came up i didn't have a lawyer yet okay that was when i'm pretty sure that was when they said okay we're gonna give you leilani adams and we're going to, they extended this no contact order for, and I'm not allowed to contact either of my children, their family, my family. I mean, this restraining order covers a lot of people. That says that in here somewhere. Um, anybody around them, in no way, shape, or form. This was right before Mother's Day. This was. Right, May 3rd. And then, so how it works is, how it worked with me was, they, I didn't have a lawyer, I didn't really speak, I don't think I was asked, I don't remember, a lot of it's fuzzy about how the court dates went, because I was in the midst of so much trauma of what they were doing to me, um, and so baffled, and so confused, and so broken they were breaking me it was working it worked for a while it's crazy um but then so at the three-day one they extended this one for a couple months afterwards and for some reason I never got to defend myself against any of this my lawyer never brought it up my version of the story my version <laughs> the truth never told this is still on my record that someone got a restraining order against me i'm not a restraining order type of person at all <laughs> like i don't know so that was a big part of how they were able to manipulate the courts and both lawyers you have my a court appointing attorney and the other one were very manipulative as well and we're going to talk about that too um i'm going to end this we're at 40 almost 45 um, this was a long one. Thank you guys so much. I really, I didn't know. 
you think about the courts, you think about the justice system. When we grow up in school, in public school here in the United States, we're taught about fairness and justice and truth, right? That's not what I've experienced. And my babies don't even know. Two years, they've been inundated, inundated around nothing but people who have some weird vengeance to get me against me that I don't know. I literally don't know what I did to them. And nobody seems to have any answers for me on what I did to them. Um, it's a lot about money. It's a lot about greed. And if you go back, if you're on YouTube, the video is called The Motive. Um, if you're on Facebook and the Courthouse Kidnapping page, the video is, I think it's video two. And I talk about the house and how Jennifer... has hated me ever since I had to sell the house. I, I mean, I don't even know how else to explain that. But thank you guys all for watching. I appreciate all of you. Um, check out the store that I'm doing for this whole campaign. If you, and now I'm making all these videos. You can't comment on them because I received so much bullying online going through this and even before going through this that I've decided that bullying will not be tolerated and so I've cut off all the comments altogether on all these videos everything that I'm saying there are no questions these are statements these are bold statements and if there is a question I can promise you it's rhetorical um, but they're all shareable and if anyone sees this and feels the need or compelled to share it with any law enforcement any detectives any other lawyers just for another take I welcome that um, absolutely welcome that. This is also hard. And I try to make these videos a little faster because things need to happen. Things aren't good. Um, but thank you. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I appreciate all of you. Um, just thank you. Check out the links below. Check out the YouTube. Check out the shop with the t-shirts. It's a great way to support this cause. Um, and just hope everyone has like a really beautiful day and, and be stay vigilant be careful about people around you I think that's a really important lesson that I've learned here thanks guys